So we are going to pick up with our study of spiritual gifts. And as we have done every week, as we have done this, we're going to uh, go over our guiding scripture, which is from 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11. And in that passage, Peter says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. All right, and just like we've done every week, I'm going to remind you of what spiritual gifts are. What's the definition? Who's going to take a stab at it tonight? Jeremy's not here to save you. So uh, somebody else is going to have to step up and, and remember what the definition is. Oh, no, 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 just spiritual gifts in general. Yeah, what are spiritual gifts in general? Oh, so good. Yeah, no, not prophecy, but just spiritual gifts. Scott. There you go. Any ability that's empowered by the Holy Spirit and used in any ministry of the church, any service of the church. Absolutely. All right. So last week we talked about prophecy and that was a good conversation um, on a topic that is interesting and challenging for us because of its usage in the Old Testament and the New Testament and a little bit of difference between the two. Tonight, we're going to talk about one that's a little bit easier. I hope. And that's the gift of teaching. Uh, now, I say easier. For those of you who have been in a teaching capacity, you know that that's not the easiest thing to do. Um, but at the same time, it is, uh, it is a spiritual gift. So what is teaching? How would we define this from a spiritual gift perspective? We would say that it's the ability to explain Scripture and apply it to people's lives. That's the spiritual gift of teaching. Now, if you think about this, it doesn't really sound all that different than how we might define teaching in general. But the emphasis here is on scripture and being able to apply it into people's lives. I can remember when I was teaching in academia and I would always have this slide at the beginning of my classes that said that uh, one of the unfortunate things about many college professors is that they take very complicated subject matter and make it more complicated. Um, and if you've sat in on some classes with people, you know that sometimes they can take something and, and in order to make themselves sound smarter, they complicate it. The whole purpose of teaching is to take complicated matters and make them easy to understand. And so there's a lot of things that that implies. There's a lot of, we'll say, corollary gifts that come along with teaching, and we'll talk about that tonight um, as we look at the characteristics of this spiritual gift. But, um, but this is basically how we would define it. It's just the ability to explain scripture and apply it to people's lives. So let's consider the different scriptures that speak of teaching. The first one that we'll look at is 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And it's one that I know you know very well. It's all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped, for every good work. That's the first thing we see scripture being good for, right? It's teaching. And so that's why if we're talking about teaching as a spiritual gift, it's the ability to take scripture and explain it to people in such a way that it, they, it helps them to apply it to their lives. And we'll see a little bit later, if you have someone who can just come in here and dig in and understand what the scripture means, but they have no idea how to tell you or help you see how to live it out, 
that's complete. That's that's completely inadequate uh, because that kind of knowledge will just create pride in a person. Scripture is always for for application. Okay, so another one, Second uh, Timothy two two. Paul tells Timothy, and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So we see that there are people in the church to teach, and uh, elders are to, to seek those people out, to look for them, and to um, take what they have learned, pass it on to others so that they may be able to teach others as well and you have a passing on of knowledge of understanding um, and of discipling in Titus 2 1 through 5 now we shouldn't be surprised first of all that so far these three uh, scripture references are coming from the pastoral epistles Uh, these are the instructions that Paul gave to Timothy and to Titus as they are setting up churches uh, all around Uh, Timothy was in Ephesus at the time Titus was on Crete, and so he's, he's telling him, hey, I put you in these places for these purposes. Here's how to do things. So Titus 2, 1 through 5, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to too much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. And then Colossians 1.28, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. The idea of teaching is to build people up. And we saw that in Titus, we saw that in Timothy, we see that in Colossians. Teaching is a building process. It is is building and equipping people to be stronger in their faith and better prepared to live out a life for Christ. That's what teaching's about. And then I have one more for you, Titus 3.14. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. The basic truth here is that you can be the best teacher in the world, but if you don't have students, you're not getting very far. Uh, Teachers teach others. They teach themselves as well, but, but a primarily a teacher, right, is someone who has people underneath them who are learning from them. And so within the context of the church where our spiritual gifts are being exercised, um, perhaps in, in what we might call the most obvious ways, then it makes sense that those who are teaching within the church are people that we should listen to and learn from. Let our people learn to devote themselves. Well, how do, how do they learn to devote themselves to good works and, and be helpful uh, and not be unfruitful? It's by listening to the teaching of the word in, in such a way as to be applied. So let's talk about teaching and some of the characteristics that we see in those who have the gift of teaching. The first one is what we might call a concern for systematic sequence. In other words, there's this idea that we're going to present things in an orderly fashion to make them easy to understand. Have you ever sat under a scatterbrained teacher? One who just bounces here and there, and maybe by the end, you know that there were a lot of points, but how they were connected, that's anybody's guess. In the teacher's mind, they were, but it's all over the place. Well, the gift of teaching is being able to take all of those ideas that are all over the place and put them into a systematic ordering so that they're easy to understand, easy to follow, they make logical sense, and that we can learn from them. Uh, I've got a passage here from Luke chapter 1, and I think it's very appropriate because Luke was a teacher. 
He was the physician, we know that, right? Luke, the physician. But look at what he does at the beginning of his gospel. He said, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Do you see what he's doing there? I'm taking all these eyewitness accounts, all these things that we've witnessed, all these things that others have witnessed, and we're putting them into an orderly account so that you may have certainty concerning what you have already heard, what you have already been taught. Here's the evidence of it. I'm putting it out for you here. So when we think about this um, in terms of systematic sequence, right, you're, you're moving down. You're going to have points. You're going to have subpoints. Now, it may not be, you know, some people do that a little bit more overtly. Um, I do, for instance, on Sunday morning or on Wednesday night. Look at what we have here, right? The point is characteristics. Subpoint number one is a concern for systematic sequence. We're going to have some more following that. Um, and then we're going to move on to the next point, right? Things are organized. Now, I do that for a number of reasons. One is I think it's a good teaching strategy. I think it helps people to have things in that format to follow along. Two, it helps me as I'm teaching to know where we're going. Um, some people are fine with bullet points. Uh, my notes on Wednesday night are bullet points. My notes on a Sunday morning are a manuscript. Uh, my sermons are, are written out uh, in full paragraphs. And I do that in my preparation so that I know I've completed my thoughts. I know that the points that I'm trying to make uh, from the text are fleshed out and in full, um, and and that's just how I do it. It's, that's my strategy. Others have others, other strategies, and that's okay. God's wired each one of us a little bit different in that regard, even those who have a gift of teaching, and, and that's okay. But the idea for all teachers is we're going to present this in such a way that you can pick it up and follow along carefully. Now, a second characteristic, and this is one that is incredibly important today, especially. There's a concern for accuracy of words and use of language. So when you think about a teacher, you know, as they're working through this, uh, uh, you might think of it as being characterized by the phrase, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that word that you used? Um, you, teachers are very careful about their word choice. They're very deliberate in terms of how they phrase things. And I try very carefully when I'm teaching the Word of God, when I'm teaching Scripture, to be very deliberate. And that's also another reason why I manuscript sermons because I want to be sure that the concepts I'm trying to explain are worded just right. Because when you're in the moment and you're really getting going, you can get tongue-tied sometimes. It happens even if you have a manuscript. And maybe you guys, I don't read a manuscript in the pulpit. I don't just stand there and read a paper to you. I'm preaching. That's a different different format. That's a style of, of teaching. It's, it's in there. Uh, but, but preaching has a different uh, emphasis as well. Um, but I want to be very careful about how I phrase things. For instance, when we were studying the Trinity, it is incredibly important to get the accuracy of your language right when you're speaking of that. Because if you don't, you are very apt to veer off into the land of heresy. And that is not a place you want to go. It's a terrible place. Okay, so you want to have precise definitions. 
you know, understand the nuance of words, the shades of meaning that words have, um, and, and use them appropriately. Uh, teachers are very, very careful about that. There's another aspect about teachers. They have a delight in researching and reporting details. Teachers love to get in there and find out stuff. They love to dig in. Um, they have a, a real focus on personal research and learning. And the reason that they do is because they want to know more so that they can then take it and share it with others and explain. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying, right? Leaders are readers. Um, if you have a teacher who doesn't read, they're not going to have a whole lot to share with you. That's just the reality. Um, and I can tell you the folks here who serve in teaching ministry, whether it's the elders who are here or Sunday school teachers or whatever, you know, we have that wonderful Sunday school leaders quarterly, and it has some good information in it, more than what's in the quarterly that most people have. Um, but they're not just using that. They're digging into other things, too. They're, they're finding out more information, whether it's from Scripture or other sources. Um, they're researching. They're, they're finding out that stuff, and they want to uh, share it. So here's where we start to see some of those corollary gifts that are included with the gift of teaching. And we would say the gift of knowledge is included here. Right? There's, there's an understanding. Teachers, God has equipped people who are good teachers, typically with a very good memory as well. Have you noticed that? Um, it's just that they're able to not only learn things, but hold on to them and talk about them later. If you guys wanted to get together after the service, and talk about the Supreme Court justice nomination process, I can do that with you because I used to teach it. Um, if you want to talk about constitutional law, uh, I can do that. I used to teach constitutional law. Uh, I still remember those things. I may not remember to pick up my shoes sometimes, Sorry, Aaron, but there's only so much bandwidth up here for remembering things, and, and it's already taken up. Uh, so that's my story. I'm sticking with it. Um, anyway, we have those gifts of knowledge, and there is a delight that people have who want to teach in knowing as much about a subject as they can. Okay? And, and those who have the spiritual gift of teaching they want to know that not just so that they can be the smartest person in the room. That's a whole other uh, problem. They're not doing it to be prideful. They're doing it so that they can be better equipped to serve the people of the church, the people that they are ministering to in their teaching capacity. Okay, so they want to get in there and they're digging deep and they're finding out more and more information. They're looking for more resources and books and, and things like that to help uh, them understand this. I'm going to pick a little bit on Lindsay for just a moment because I know that she works with our youth and teaches them. And what was it, about two years ago, I think, you made a connection with one of our speakers at the uh, Reasonable Faith Conference that we host here at Faith, which is an apologetics conference. She made a connection with him. He's the director of the Norman Geisler Institute uh, for apologetics and such. It just was something that really struck Lindsay as something that interested her. And she's been taking classes through that on her own time for a couple of years now. How's that been going? Yeah, yeah, I expect you to take a break, that's okay. Um, but you've taken uh, different classes, and, and how has that helped you in what you're doing? <laughs> I have to ask the, the youth. Uh, I won't put them on the spot uh, here, um, but 
I know it has informed your teaching and it has informed your ability to explain scripture in ways to help them know what they believe and share what they believe. Yeah, I, I, I know you said I hope so. I know so. It's, a, it's good, okay? That's why you do that. You want to get in there, research, and then report those details, right? Um, that's a good thing. And so this follows. There's a concern for knowledge and understanding. It's not just knowledge. We talked about that a moment ago, right? Acquisition of knowledge is not enough to be a teacher. Anybody can do that. You can go out and find out all... If, if you want to know something about the Edmund Fitzgerald, talk to my son Elijah. He can tell you whatever you want to know about the Edmund Fitzgerald, how long it was, when it sank, who the captain was, who the captain of the ship was that was with the Edmund Fitzgerald, how many sailors went down, what it was carrying, where it was going. Those are facts, right? He's learned those. He's studied those. He, he has that. Um, but the acquisition of knowledge for a teacher is not enough. You can go on Wikipedia and find out all of that. Understanding is the, is the taking of that knowledge, and as we said in the definition, learning how to apply it. Understanding knowledge is so that it can be applied in our life, okay? So knowing a fact and understanding it, two different things, but both are necessary in the course of teaching. Uh, a teacher has to understand and has to be able to share that, of course, but they also have to have knowledge too, right? Um, if you have a teacher that doesn't have knowledge, again, you don't have much of a teacher, uh, that, that class is going to go really short because there's just not going to be content. That's just not going to be there. Teachers also have good communication skills. They have to. Um, it, it's... Uh, uh, they're, they're going to be able to keep people's attention. They're going to be able to phrase things in such a way as that they're pithy, they, they get your attention, they hold your attention. Uh, many of you maybe have seen the 80s movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And you may remember a certain character from that movie, uh, the teacher who was played by Ben Stein. And Ben Stein was the teacher that just, Bueller, Bueller. And then there were some scenes where he was teaching and he's, you know, just kind of saying things, leaving blanks for the class to, and it's just that monotone, doesn't change cadence, doesn't change tone uh, kind of approach. That's not good communication. Now, of course, Ben Stein, that was all for show. Um, many of you maybe have even seen a movie that he did called Expelled back in the mid-2000s, I think, late 2000s, about um, evolution and uh, intelligent design, the opposition to it within college campuses and such. How many of you have ever listened to that dry, monotone teacher? Yeah. What were you doing, Scott, since you raised your hand, what were you doing as you were listening to that individual? Notes. Taking copious notes so you could stay awake. Thank you for finishing that up. Uh, right? There, there, absolutely. Isaac. Yes. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah, you do. Right. You do need to know your audience, and that's part of what makes you a good communicator, isn't it? Um, is knowing who you're speaking to. So when I taught undergraduates, I knew I had to hold that because I'm teaching them a core class. Usually it was national government. And everybody just loved to come in and talk about U.S. government, right? Especially when it was a 9 o'clock in the morning class. They loved it. 
I even had an eight o'clock national government class one year uh, that I taught. And all those kids were so excited to be there every single morning. But actually, I told them at the beginning of every class, uh, the first class of the year, I always told them, I said, I'll make an agreement with you. I will show up on time, excited to teach every single class. You show up on time, excited to learn every class. And so I did things to, to help get their attention, right? Occasionally, I would show a Schoolhouse Rocks video, right? I'm just a bill to kind of talk about how legislation moves through Congress. And then I tell them that doesn't, that's not real. Okay, that's the, that's the Schoolhouse Rock version. Now I'm gonna teach you how a bill actually goes through Congress, right? And how it becomes a law. And then they're like, oh, wait a minute, what? I learned that on Saturday morning. It was cool. I can remember the words. This isn't real? Nope, it's not real. Here we go. Uh, in general, yes, but not, not the specifics. Did you have enough money for that? What's that? Did you have enough money for that class? Yes, yes. Uh, you know, we just, you, you learn different ways, right? Um, I would tell jokes sometimes. Uh, I would... Uh, just find different ways to engage people uh, with it because I wanted the material to be exciting. I wanted it to be interesting to the students because it didn't do them any good if they were bored out of their gourds sitting there. Uh, if I wanted to create productive citizens in our nation, they need to know these things. So try to make it exciting. So you need the good communication skills in order to do that. And those are things that some people have them to start with. Some people need to hone them a little bit. And the reality is everybody needs to hone them somewhat. Uh, I can tell you when I was starting out, uh, I was terrified to speak in front of a crowd. Um, shaking hands the whole nine yards, qui quivering voice. Uh, you may not know that now, but it was absolutely the case. Those things I, I was able to pick up on. Uh, the last characteristic I want to share with you as it regards to teaching is that they have a reverence and a respect for the Word of God. It's both. There's a reverence and a respect. They're always seeking the truth of God's word. Sometimes people want to communicate an idea that they have. And they will do so and then go to scripture and find something to support it. That's, that's what's called proof texting. And that's wrong. Okay, that is, that is the misapplication of scripture. So if you want to tell people that God wants them to be healthy and wealthy and everything that they do all their life, then that's your idea. I can go to some scriptures and yank them out of context and cause people to, to think that. That's possible. But a true teacher, a teacher who, who wants people to grow in their faith are going to have a reverence and respect for the word such that when they go to the word, they're going to look at the whole context of it, right? They're going to start in the context of the paragraph in which that, that passage is found. And then they're going to look at the context of the chapter and of the book as a whole, and then the bigger context of scripture as a whole, and the narrative of redemption and, and things that are moving through scripture as a whole. And they're going to look at that ever-expanding context in order to make sure that their interpretation and handling of the word of God, the word of truth, is right. Because the last thing they ever want to do is subvert the word of God. Um, that's something that is always weighing on my mind as I prepare sermons, as I prepare Wednesday night studies, or any time I'm doing a a lesson or something like that, uh, that I want to make sure we're, I'm doing it well and I'm doing justice to God's word that I'm rightly dividing the word of truth because it's entirely possible I could get it wrong. I don't want to, 
So we have to take great care with that and not subvert it. Does anybody have any questions about the characteristics of a teacher? Or the gift of teaching, I should say. Okay, well, let's talk about some of the concerns then. Oh, yes, Scott. Oh, there, there's a difference because the, the gift of prophecy is that black and white, this is how it is, kind of uh, uh, this is the truth, I'm, I'm proclaiming it. Now, there could be a teaching component to that, but not necessarily. It, it could just be this is the truth, do it. I don't need to explain it to you. I don't need you to necessarily understand it. I just need you to do it. The teacher may have a prophetic gift as well in being very straightforward and forthright in their proclamation of it, but not necessarily. I can, I can give you a lot of Bible teachers who aren't prophetic in their uh, style, and I can give you some who are. So, yeah, there's overlap, but it's not, it's not exactly the same. So I hope that explains a little bit there what that difference is. Yep, good, good. All right, so let's talk about some of the concerns regarding teaching. The first one, I, you know, I think this one's pretty obvious, but I want to say it anyway. Beware of false teachers. There are false teachers out there. Yes, Judy. Yeah, that's an interesting, I, I would have to listen to that a little more carefully as to what they were saying, um, because there's a difference between eternal life that we have in Christ yeah. and being an eternal being, because eter eternality in that regard is an attribute of God, and it's one that's his alone. There is no yeah. other being yeah. in the universe that is eternal in that sense of having no beginning and no end. We have a beginning, but every single human being at, at that point has no end. Okay, so that is something that's true. Now, it can be eternal life in Christ, or it can be eternal punishment in hell. Those are your, but, but everybody's going to have that, right? Um, so there, but there's a starting point and, and there is a false teaching that is the pre-existence idea, uh, that all of us have souls and souls are eternal and souls pre-exist and are just waiting for us to be conceived and have a body to come and inhabit. Okay. That's, there are some who per, Probably the most uh, the well-known one would be the Mormon church in terms of presenting that idea. Um, and in fact, that is the reason why Mormons typically have large families. It's because there's a whole bunch of little souls waiting to have bodies, and they need good Mormons to produce the bodies so the souls can come down here and inhabit them. Correct. I am a sinful human being who will go to be with uh, God in heaven sometime. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I, I'm a sinful human being. I'm not. Uh, 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 uh. Right, right. No, I agree with you. So we have to beware of false teachers. And it can be subtle, right? Because that one's one, if you weren't listening real closely to it, you might have. Yeah just thought eternal life and moved on. But to say we're an eternal being is, I think, too far. Yeah. Okay. So let's consider some 
passages of scripture where we see warnings about false teachers and consider what that means for us. First one's from Jesus I have for you, Matthew 5, 19, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So here we have an idea that there are teachings, teachers going on who are relaxing God's commandments. Oh, you don't have to worry about that. Oh, don't worry about that little sin. It's okay. Uh, you're saved. You're good. You don't have to worry about holiness. You don't have to worry about obedience or faithfulness. Uh, just, man, you've been saved. Go live life in the freedom of Christ. I've heard people proclaim this. Oh, my goodness. It takes every ounce of what I have not to yell at the TV when I've seen, or the radio, if I hear somebody saying something like that. They're taking a passage of scripture and completely ripping it out of context, talking about the freedom we have in Christ. Do you know what the best freedom we have in Christ is? We're free not to sin. <laughs> Praise God, right? We're freed from the bondage of sin. Oh, so good. All right, and, and so look at what he says there, right? There's uh, the one who relaxes the least of these and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And in this case, you know, Jesus is talking about people who are themselves believers, but they're wrong. They're teaching wrong things, whether on purpose or just because they're careless. They're teaching wrong things. But the, whoever does them and teaches them, and I think that's a good uh, juxtaposition there because that also fits with Ezra 7.10. If you remember, what did Ezra do? He was going to teach the law of God, but, but he studied the law, he did the law, and then he taught the law. And so look at what Jesus says here, but whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Yeah, it's not just enough for me to get up here and tell you on Sunday morning, hey, go live this way if I'm not first living it. If I'm not first doing it myself, then I don't understand it, first of all. I don't truly understand what it means to live that out. And I can't tell you how. So there's the first one, right? We understand that aspect. A second passage of scripture comes from 2 Peter 2, one through three. And Peter says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So he's using the Old Testament as an example here and said in, in the days of Israel, there were false prophets who came among the people. We know that as you read the Old Testament narratives, right, and histories. You see there were false prophets who popped up all the time and taught terrible things. And just like that, there will be false teachers who come in among the church, and they will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them. Um, people who come in and say things like, well, Jesus was a good teacher, right? You're right, he was the best teacher, but he was so much more. He was so much more. And, and you can't, uh, and look at what their result is. It's, it's swift destruction. Um, that's, that's a sobering thought for those who feel they have the gift of teaching. Judy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, in, the, in these days, there are going to be those who come and they're going to say all kinds of false teachings in order to, uh, as Jesus would say, if it were possible to deceive even the elect. Um, and that's not possible. Jesus said, if it were possible, that's how good these false teachers are, that they would be able to, sw uh, to, to steal even people who are saved. Nope not going to happen, but there are people who will be deceived along the way. And that does include the saved. It just means that they're not going to lose their salvation uh, in that situation. 
Okay, so we want to uh, be very, very careful here. Uh, Peter goes on to say, and many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. See, he's following up with that and saying, man, there's going to be a lot who follow their false teachings. And notice what he calls it. He calls it their sensuality, right? So many false teachings have to do with pleasing the flesh in various ways. And so he says this to say, listen, as a result, the way of truth will be blasphemed. Think about that. How many people have followed these false teachings, have went out, for instance, that you can go and live however you want to. Holiness is optional for believers. And so they go out and they follow that. I mean, how man, I can remember, you know, the things that were said about folks that, oh, yeah, they're out partying on Saturday night, but they're at church on Sunday morning, you know, singing in the choir, but you should have seen them Friday night or Saturday night and what they were doing and what they were saying. That's, and, and what ends up happening? What do the lost say? Well, I can tell you what the lost say, because I know of a situation, uh, you know, personally where that happened with a guy and people in that town said the only difference between me and the people at that church is they get up early on Sunday morning. If that's the only difference between Christians and the world, God forgive us. There has to be something different. We have to be a peculiar people in this world. We need to look different. We need to smell different. We need to, and I don't mean just different cologne and perfume or not taking a bath. I mean, there ought to be an aroma about us from our way of life that causes people to go, something's, something's different about you, right? And the Bible even talks about that. It says that, that we are the aroma of death to those who are lost and perishing because they, they smell Jesus on us. And, and, but to those who are being saved, it's, it's life. So, so that's where we are, okay? Um, let's go on to 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. For the time is coming, and this speaks, Judy, to what you were saying a moment ago. Uh, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. I, I have to be careful here because I don't want to come across as boastful or anything, but I think that the teaching here at Faith is solid. Now, I say that as the primary teacher Okay, um, but you know me. I put out, you know, in, in saying what I say and putting it forward to you, and I have always said, test it all. If anything that I say is wrong, don't believe it. Uh, only imitate me as far as I imitate Christ. Um, and that's, that's it. So I, I say I think that the teaching here is sound teaching. I believe that we hold to sound doctrine. If that's the case, why is it not standing room only on Sunday morning? I'm not saying that because I'm offended or hurt or anything like that. Please don't hear that. That's not it. But there are, there are a lot of other churches, not just here in Battle Creek, but all over the place, where there's a lot more people. So what's, what's the difference sometimes? Well, sometimes, not all the time, sometimes the difference is that what's being preached is not sound doctrine, and the people who are there don't want to hear sound doctrine. Um, you know, that's, that's been the case. Scott, I saw your hand up.
having sound doctrine is hard to, hard to hear. People don't want to get up at 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning to have their toes stepped on, which is what we need every so often. Every so often, you, okay, if you're doing biblical sound doctrine, your toes are going to get stepped on. You're, you're going to be called to repentance. And repentance isn't easy. No, I, I think, think that's right. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that that's, that's part of it. Um, but the reality is that if people have itching ears or they want their ears tickled, as, as some translations uh, phrase it, they're going to go where they're told, you're good, right? Uh, and, and everything's okay. And I'm just going to help you find your best life now. Um, not picking on anybody in particular. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's, there's a challenge for those who want to preach down doctrine. And I've, I've always known um, that if we want a whole lot of people here, then our style would have to change dramatically. I would not preach expositorily verse by verse through books of the Bible as a general principle because that's not what attracts people. They want a, you know, top five list. You know, five ways to uh, live your best life. Five ways to experience victory. Five, you know, stuff like that. Um, that's not what we do. That's not what the elders here are committed to. Um, and I praise God for that. But God has given us uh, growth here, and that's been a good thing. So hold your questions. I know that's coming, but I've got two more things I want to get through, and I've got ten minute, nine minutes now to do it. Okay, so I have two more concerns I want to bring to you for those who have a gift of teaching to be aware of. The second one is pride, and that gets right to what... Uh, I was speaking of just a moment ago. Listen, if you're gifted as a teacher, then you're going to get a lot of accolades. You're going to get people who come up to you and say, wow, thank you so much for explaining that to me. You really helped me to understand it. You do such a good job. They pat you on the back, and if you're not careful, you'll start believing their hype. Um, and you'll start thinking, wow, I really am smart you'll start forgetting that the reason you're able to understand these things is by the power of the Holy Spirit within you, who is giving you the understanding and who has given you this gift and, and given you the gift of knowledge and understanding and wisdom to then take and apply it into your life and then into the life of others. And this is a subtle trap. It's a very subtle trap. You won't even know you're being prideful because you won't see it in yourself. That is, pride is insidious. It is, it's that sin that, boy, you don't see in yourself. Others see it in you. But when they bring it to you, you don't want to hear it. Nobody wants to be told you're an arrogant jerk. Um, it's not usually the way people like to, to be greeted. Um, but pride is always there. And that's why scripture warns of that, right? It says there is a knowledge that puffs up. There is a knowledge that causes you to be prideful. And if what you're doing is studying and teaching in order to be the smartest guy in the room and be the person who knows everything and the person that is the go-to person uh, for people, for advice and information and stuff like that, may I suggest you're doing it wrong? You're doing it for the wrong reason. You're doing it with, a, with the wrong heart attitude and motivation there. So you have to watch out for pride. You have to take care and guard your heart against it. Um, and that's a hard thing. The other thing to be aware of as somebody with a gift of teaching is what's called information dump. Um, you have a gift for researching and getting information. This may come as a surprise to some of you I don't preach everything on Sunday morning that I've learned about that passage of Scripture. Some of you may go, what more did you have? 
But the reality is, there's a lot of information out there, right? And, you know, my family can attest to what my desk looks like when I'm preparing uh, and, and writing uh, a sermon. There's stacks of books on my desk. Books open here, 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 and spin around and on the bed. There's open books over there, too. And that's not even counting all the electronic books that I have open in Logos that I'm working on and reading through and, and things like that. And things I've read already that I've got bookmarked and highlighted or underlined or things that I go back and grab and reference for a message at some point um, and pull up and, and things like that. There's a lot of information and there is a temptation that teachers have to just take all of that information and pour it out on the audience. That doesn't do anybody any good because it's drinking from the fire hose. And that is, that's a not effective way to take a drink. It's not an effective way to consume, right? You have to take that information and that's where knowledge and understanding and wisdom comes into play as you take all of these disparate pieces of information about the thing that you're teaching and you bring them together and you weave them together in that systematic sequence that we talked about at the beginning in order to make it understandable for the people to whom you're teaching. Uh, if you're not doing that and you're just pouring out information, again, that can lead to pride because, wow, you know so much. Well, yes, I do. Uh, you know, that can be the attitude that starts to develop within a person. Um, and, and so you have to just be very cautious about that. All right. Now, I know there were a couple of hands up. Judy, you had your hand up. We have a few minutes left. Uh, Uh, you know, I hate to hear accounts like that because that was a gospel outpost that's been damaged. Um, and, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't have the wrong attitude about that. Our, our attitude about things like that should be heartbrokenness. I know you should warn people. I, I think the teachers, elders especially, have a responsibility as shepherds uh, under Christ to warn the flock of false teachers. If you read through scripture, Paul warns of people. John warns of people. Specifically, not just, oh, be careful of a person that teaches like this. He says, watch out for Diotrephes. Uh, Alexander the coppersmith. You know, he, he names names, right? I think we ought to be careful if we're going to name names. You better be awfully sure that what they're teaching is truly false doctrine and not just something that you don't like. Um, be careful about that. But I have no problem saying, hey, Joel Osteen, false teacher. False teacher. Avoid him. Mark him. Avoid him. Do not listen to him. Do not buy his books. Um, do, not, do not support that in any way, right? Um, but at the same time, I'm heartbroken when I see his church. It's at Lake Point, Lake Point, Lake Side, Lake something. Lakewood. Lakewood. Okay, Lake something. Whatever that church is, <laughs> it's an it's an old basketball arena. There's 14,000 people gathered in that thing on Sunday morning, not to mention how many people watching online. My heart's broken because I know what they're getting. It's not the truth. 
It's false teaching. It ought to be what breaks our heart there. Scott, did you have your hand up earlier? No. Isaac, did you? No? Okay. Okay. Well, we've got about a minute. Does anybody have any other questions or comments about this spiritual gift? No? Yes. I have one. When we go back, and I think of Erie when he first started to teach, and he was nervous, but he was a good teacher. But the more he studied, the more excited he was, and the more we wanted that, what Harry had. Because mm. he says, I just couldn't stop. And he went back and looked up and did this and that. And it made the class so interesting. And his excitement was just, it made us want. Yes, absolutely. What a beautiful testimony there. Um, I, I think that's exactly right. That as Harry was starting off, he was a little nervous. He hadn't done that really in that capacity. He took it incredibly seriously. He understood what he was doing and how weighty that matter was. Uh, but as he did and as he dug in, the riches of Christ that he found in, in the Word just all it could do was excite him. And then that excitement carried over into class. And then that excitement carried over to those who were learning under him. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you for sharing that. I'm beginning to think that Harry's walk with the Lord was so close that the Lord took him to be with him, kind of similar to Enoch. Well, I, I, I don't know that I can speak to that. But uh, I can say that his walk with Christ was close and growing closer. Uh, and as such, it was an example to each one of us as to how we ought to walk with the Lord as well. And so I think that's a good place to, uh, to close and to, uh, uh, to dismiss in prayer. So will you join us uh, as we pray? Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for those whom you have given as teachers to the church. Father, I thank you that as we study your word and see about these different spiritual gifts, we see those who have been given uh, this specific gift. And we see the pitfalls, we see the dangers, we see the warnings about false teachers, and we praise you for those. But Father, we thank you so much for people like our brother Harry, who took this gift seriously and who sought to to understand scripture better so as to explain it to others and to uh, provide that example of how to apply it in our lives and be those stewards of God's very grace that we see in our passage from first Peter father as we go out from here I pray that uh, uh, we continue to follow Christ by studying his word for ourselves, by listening to those whom you have called and equipped to be teachers in your church, uh, to grow in your word under their ministry. And Father, we will give you all the honor, praise, and glory in Christ's name for what you do in us and through us for the glory of your name and the advancement of your kingdom. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.